first of all, you know, you ask what's of most concern here, and it, I can't think of anything at the federal level that's of greater concern to our constituents than WMATA and, um, you know, long, long tradition of Sarbanes is, you know, championing WMATA, and we're just, you know, it's just hurting. I mean, the, the, it's, it's crumbling before our eyes, and um, obviously the agency has put forward this um, <coughs> very ambitious plan without any real clue of how it's going to be funded. Uh, most of our gripes about failure to step up to the transportation challenge focus on Annapolis because we're counting on the state to do so much for us, but, um, you know, clearly for the Maryland delegation, it's got to it's got to be transit priority number one. We want to expand. We want to build a purple line. We want to do other things, but um, WMATA is facing such hard times. So that's my first point. The second point, and then I'll yield. Um, increasingly, as our constituents hear about the worry about the sequester, I get asked, why would the defense budget be treated in the same manner as it was when we had two hot wars going on? Is it not obvious on its face that the end of one war and the near-term drawing down of a second ought to change our defense spending priorities? So it's a question I'm relaying from my constituents, but I hear it more and more. It seems evident on its face. Obviously, defense industry is very important to Maryland, but seriously, we were fighting two wars, and soon we won't be anymore. Doesn't that change our thinking about defense spending? Well, those are both good questions. Let me start with the last one, because um, it's a reasonable observation that as we're drawing down these overseas commitments, that ought to free up uh, more resources and allow us to kind of consolidate the defense budget in some ways. Um, keep in mind, though, that the expectation of, of bringing those, of drawing those down in many of the budget mo models and assumptions has already kind of been worked in um, to the discussion. So if you talk to, um, you know, the Department of Defense, if you talk to the administration, um, and if you talk to members of Congress who are focused on the budget, like Chris uh, Van Hollen, obviously, and um, Paul Ryan in the, in the majority uh, in the House, um, they would say that they're already building 10-year models that, that have that included in it. Now, having said that, um, we did kind of break through a psychological wall um, with the defense establishment um, as a result of the debt ceiling debate and sequestration, which is, I think for the first time, you had um, the Department of Defense and other defense-related agencies and then all of the spin-off industries that are associated with them thinking seriously about how do we sort of constrain um, our spending here because the, the writing was, was on the wall in a way that it had never been before. So you're getting discussions about, you know, which weapon programs really should be continued, which are obsolete. I think um, you're getting people to, to look more seriously at the question of have some of these expenditures continued just based on sort of political influence more than sound judgment about the merits of a particular uh, weapon system. So it kind of, it had a disruptive effect that um, if we can now get to a more serious conversation about how you apply these cuts, could end, we could look back and say, well, that, that was constructive to some degree. My own view is that um, this notion that we have to have one dollar on the domestic side for one dollar on the defense side that's sort of, sort of being chained to that perspective doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We ought to evaluate um, domestic programs for the positive impact that they can have and the investment that they represent for the society here at home. Um, and if it makes sense to um, minimize some of the cuts there versus some of the things we do on the defense side, then that's the, the approach that we, that we ought to take. In terms of investing in our domestic priorities, uh, there's no priority that, that's higher um, than infrastructure. And of course, the President, I give him credit, at a critical time um, when the economy was really in tough shape and when, his, when peer nations around the world were going into a policy of extreme austerity, which they've paid for dearly, you look at Great Britain, um, you look at the, 
the unemployment rate in the Eurozone, which is 11 percent, and climbing, our president made the decision to invest. Um, because of pushback, I don't think the investment was as great as even he would have liked to see, but it was enough um, to keep the economy going. And so our unemployment rate, while it's unacceptably high for everybody still at 7.8 percent, um, is so much lower than what we're seeing in other parts of the world where they went into this, this kind of impulse of austerity. Part of that investment was infrastructure, but going forward there has to be more investment in infrastructure. And it makes perfect sense because it needs to be done when you look at the crumbling state of infrastructure, whether you're talking about transit projects or you're talking about schools, et cetera. But the other is it creates a lot of jobs. I mean, it's not like, you know, we have a situation where um, we need to create jobs, we have a pristine uh, infrastructure. <laughs> Um, or we have a crumbling infrastructure, but we have full unemployment. I mean, these things go together. We have a crumbling infrastructure, we ought to invest in it, and we can create jobs from it. And it's right for um, state and local officials and jurisdictions to have that expectation. Now, I've supported strongly the idea of, of um, creating an infrastructure, a national infrastructure bank, to help leverage these investments and build those partnerships um, at the state and local level. And I'll keep pushing for that. I think the Democrats are going to do that, and the administration regards that as a real priority.